our next presenter. Our next chef is, is a well-known pastry chef in California. She's uh, Filipina American. And uh, to introduce uh, our next uh, chef, we have her father. Yes, her Filipino father and her German husband to do the honors for us. Let me just introduce uh, uh, her father and her husband. So Ray Camacho was the first man in her life. He instilled the discipline and love to her craft. He allowed her to enjoy whatever she wants in life rather than follow a stereotype job. The heart, once again. Currently living in Los Angeles and recently retired from the aerospace industry as an engineer manager. That's Ray Camacho along with uh, Sally Camacho's uh, husband, Marcus Mueller, who is the last man in her life. Born and raised in Germany, came to the U.S. nine years ago. Now a general manager for hotels. He met Sally in Beverly Hills. They got married four years ago. And here they are, Ray Camacho and Marcus Mueller to introduce Chef Sally Camacho. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we're going to do a sort of a tag up on introducing my daughter Sally. Uh, you could call us like the Batman. I'll be Ruben since we're in the, here in the Philippines. Okay. <laughs> So uh, Sally started, by the way, Sally looks like me in real life, okay? So Sally started her culinary experience uh, as a young, as a small child. Her, ac her, actual, um, her actual inspiration is my wife, Bernadette, who's sitting in front of us. Um, she started after graduating at culinary, at California Culinary Institute of uh, California. It, um, she started there and graduated and then worked in Canil Bay for her externship. Um, and then after that, went to work for uh, Donald Russell at the Four Seasons in Beverly Hills. Soon after, she went on to work for, with uh, Frederick Robert uh, at the Wynn, when they opened up the Wynn in Las Vegas. After that, then she went on to Florida and, and became a uh, executive pastry chef at the uh, Fairmont uh, Turnberry. In 2007, Sally was part of a team that, won, that went to the national pastry competition. They were, they were an all-female uh, team. And uh, they placed second in front, of, uh, in front of the Frenchies. As a matter of fact, the Frenchies were so scared of them, they were intimidated by them. They were the darling of the Tennessee at the time. In 2009, uh, Sally was part of the USA team of the American Culinary Federation that, world, that, that won the World uh, Championship in the Olympics. Uh, in uh, 2009, Sally represent, won the United States in the C3 Valrona competition. 2011, Sally joined Top Chef, Just Dessert. Uh, she also went uh, and represented the United States in Madrid for the C3 uh, in 2012. Uh, on 20, 2012, she was one of the top 10 national, uh, she was selected as one of the top 10 uh, pastry chefs in the list of the magazine and in, uh, in dessert professionals in the United States. So um, throughout growing up, we've always told our daughters not to be, not to follow the stereotypical women role, like in the Philippines or even some of us in the United States, women are always stereotyped to be either a nurse, a doctor, a lawyer, or a secretary. Well, not that there's anything wrong with those professions, but we wanted her to follow her heart. We wanted her to follow her passion. I even told them, I don't care if you become a janitor, as long as you're the best janitor in the world. So she followed her heart, and he look at where she is right now. Isn't it kind of cool for a second generation Filipino immigrant to represent the United States. Yeah. So before we introduce her, I'd like Marcus, who's her husband, to say a few words about his wife. Hello, Marcus Müller is my name. I'm the one from Germany. The accent is real, so I hope you understand me. Um, yeah, Sally has always uh, focused on three pillars in her career to, to exhibit success and excellence, um, which is, of course, one of them, wherever she was in the most iconic and famous properties in the United States, such as um, Bradley Ogden at the Caesars Palace, where she actually got a Michelin star um, after the first year that they're open. 
uh, the reopening the famous Turnberry Island, Miami, the Ritz Carlton in Los Angeles working for that hotel and the first Ritz Carlton property in Los Angeles working also with Wolfgang Park, reopening the iconic uh, Hotel Bel Air in Los Angeles. By the way, that's where we met. And, um, and then working at the Jonathan Club in, uh, in Los Angeles as well. That was always something that where she could express her art, that where she could express her ability to create and to, to always uh, recreate something and, and, and deconstruct something and rebuild it in her own ways, always using the Filipino ingredients um, and techniques, which are fairly unknown in, in the US uh, so far. Um, the second part of her, of her focus that she would always do is the insp being an inspiration for her trade, being an inspiration for the next generation of pastry chefs that are, because it truly is an art, it's not just a, a job, it's, you have to dedicate yourself tremendously in order to be successful. So she, she taught at the um, Ewald Notter School in Orlando really well, and then she was also at the Culinary Institute of America in Napa Valley as uh, the actually first female teacher ever in their history. So, um, and then of course all the awards that uh, she has gotten over the years, and essentially she's no stranger to Madrid Fusion either. So in 2012 she represented uh, the United States in the, in the international um, competition by, Var by Varona called C3, where she placed the um, bronze and she was the highest place actually that uh, any American has ever gotten to this date in, in, um, in, in this competition. And what is the future gonna bring? What else can she do? She's done pretty much everything, so she is going to open her own place and she will do that in Los Angeles. And uh, so I know you all follow her on Instagram, on Twitter, Facebook, whatever else there is in this world. Um, but stay tuned and see, watch it because exciting things are about to happen. So enough of us now. We are the two men in our life. And uh, we now introduce you to Sally herself. So enjoy the presentation. Oh, no. <laughs> Welcome, happy afternoon everyone, happy Friday. Thank you so much for having me. Um, very excited to be here. Thank you to my husband and my father for introducing me as well. Um, so I will be talking about duck eggs and basically what came first, the duck or the egg? Do we actually really know? No, we don't. So it's really gonna be up to you how you interpret it. I personally got into cooking with duck eggs when I was an instructor over at the CIA, uh, Culinary Institute of America in Napa, in St. Helena. And we did studies on cooking with local duck eggs. We had purveyors that gave us duck eggs to cook with for our students, as well as they also, uh, they also made balot with it too. So I was, that was a little byproduct that I was happy to get as well. I love balot. So cooking with duck eggs, number one first, is flavor, and that's how I cook. So cooking with duck eggs, you don't really, there's no flavor of duck in the egg, really. It just is more flavor. It has more fat, yes, there is more cholesterol, but it's good cholesterol. It's also healthier in vitamins and nutrition than the latter, which is what we normally use in baking and cooking, which is eggs. And there's nothing wrong with chicken eggs, I'm sorry, with chicken eggs. So there's, there's nothing wrong with that, it's just, the difference of cooking with duck eggs a lot, I find, mainly is flavor. So I, cook, I like to cook flavor first. So I've made an egg-centric dessert for you guys to see. So I've done an eclair based with, of course, duck eggs. So the basic thinking of an eclair is eggs. You make a roux on the stove and then you beat in your eggs and you bake them. So what I actually do is when I, before I bake them, I take my mixture and I pipe it. So I pipe it and then I freeze it and then I cut them so that they're a little bit more um, uniform. So let's see here. I have my pâte choux, which is the base for eclair. And pâte choux, choux means cabbage. 
So it's cabbage paste. That's essentially what it means, because it looks like a little cabbage uh, when you bake it. So this is my mixture, and I put a nice little, uh, it's a French star tip, um, and I like to pipe it just straight into logs. Very nice, even movement, just like so. The parchment lined paper. And I fill up the tray, and then I'll freeze this. Freezing doesn't really impart anything. The only thing is to cut it when it's frozen so that it's a uniform shape. And people really like to see that. It's more pleasant to the eye, so making something a little bit more uniform. So when something is also uniform, it bakes uniform. If you've got little, little things that are, that are maybe bigger than others, if you have a smaller piece of eclair, it'll bake faster than another one. So this is how I like to do it, and it's, of course, pleasing to the eye. So once again, just a simple pipe, straight and steady. Everyone can do that at home, yes? So, after we've frozen it, we cut it and we bake it. So here we have our baked little shoe, just like so. And we're going to place them with some mango cremeux. We have a knife. Oh, okay. So we're just going to poke these a little bit. Hmm. Oh, hold on one second. Okay, I see. Okay. So there's a little hole on the side, and we just push the filling in. And so this is a mango cremeux that I use with manila mangoes, basic uh, egg custard mixture, like an anglaise. So your mango and your cream together with some sugar, and then you make an anglaise with duck eggs. So this is with duck egg yolks. And then I'm going to fill just two more. So we do three per plate. Let's do that. OK. And then. Here is our plate. Okay. Um, mango sauce. So a couple, a couple components that I do have that accentuate this dish are mango, essentially because we are in Manila, and I love Manila mangoes. We don't get this in Los Angeles. They try to imitate, but it's never as good. Um, so being here, I'm trying to eat as much as I can of it. and. Uh, I've incorporated it in this dish for you guys as well. So, I just have a simple uh, mango sauce, just this pureed mangoes with fresh turmeric and vanilla bean. And I like using turmeric to uh, enhance mango because it's just something a little bit different. It's also um, good for you if you know the, the properties of turmeric. It's very good for your body. It's an antioxidant, and I like to cook with it, also eat it, um, or put it in smoothies. So why not put it in a dessert as well? Um, it adds a nice color to the mango also, which it already naturally has. So I'm just going to spoon a little bit of sauce. And then I'm going to place my little shoe alongside, just kind of organically. And then the other things that I do have to add components as far as uh, the mango is the yema, which I've done. Actually, if we can walk over here, uh, this is just duck egg yolks, plain and simple duck yolks, no sugar, no nothing added, put into cryovac bag. And we've sous vide it, that's what we call it, it's under pressure, meaning under pressure. At 66, I know in the recipe I, I put 64 degrees. 64 degrees is also really nice, but it's a little bit more fluid. So I actually decided to go 66 just so that it has a little bit of a uh, structure to it. Um, so just those two degrees more really, really makes, makes a difference as far as how high you can pipe it or, or, or add to your dish rather than it being too fluid. So I like the 66. It's up to you if you um, want to go a little bit more fluid or a little um, more strong. So with the duck yolk yema, I have one that I've done ahead of time, and I've chilled it. So after it's done in there for 45 minutes, we ice bath it, and then we'll just use it for this. I've, I've, I've cut this a little bit, so it's not just a round tip. It's, a, it's like a little V cut, so it, it's a little bit more different. 
So just as far as shape. Just a little bit. And then more on the plate because we like the duck yolk. It's very delicious, nice velvety smooth finish on your mouth also, and the flavor is just really, really great with everything. The crisp of the shoe, the duck yolk, really, really great all together. And then another added is I have some caramel, which is actually something that you might find alongside Yemma, or at least I did. Um, it's a hard, crispy caramel over, over egg yolk candy. So this is a little bit of my interpretation. This is a vanilla bean with really just water. And so I've dry cameled um, sugar and then just add water. So it's just basically a caramel syrup just with some vanilla bean. And vanilla goes very well with mango, so I, I like to add that accent as well, often with mango. So I'm just gonna drizzle this, kind of trying to get some onto the duck yolk. And I actually do have some meringue that I wanted to try. It's actually in the dehydrator in the kitchen. Can we grab that really quick? With all the commotion and excitement, I forget a little bit. <laughs> so. Um, the other component I did add as far as for some texture um, and flavor is the duck skin. So what I've done is I've dehydrated it in a dehydrator. So overnight, really low, maybe like, I think it was like one, 130 Celsius overnight. So you get this nice little sheen duck skin. And then we fried it. So we get our little duck chicharron. So we have a duck chicharron, and then what I actually like to use also for dessert is garam masala, which is a Indian spice. Um, there's different mixtures of garam masala. I like using it for a sweet aspect. There's cloves, cinnamon, fenugreek, uh, yellow pepper, turmeric, cardamom, uh, did I say fenugreek, fenugreek? Fenugreek, cinnamon for sure. Um, and then some, some people have their own mixes. So it's very fragrant, so I have this mixture here, which is sugar, the garam masala, as well as some salt, because salt always heightens flavor, so I like to use that. So I just dip this in the sugar, and then dust it off, and then just place it on top of my yema. And I just have a few pieces. Like so. And then the other thing that I did have, yes. So we have some little herbs, which we like to use in pastry. Yes, thank you. So we have amaranth here, and because they're pretty, and they also add a little bit of pop of herbaceousness. Um, there's a little um, acid notes on the amaranth also, which is surprising, but it's very, very nice. So acid is also very good to add for taste notes. And then we just let it fall organically, as things do. And one thing I did make was with the duck eggs is these meringues, actually. I'll take them. Um, and I used a tip called the Sultan tip, um, and you can get it online. It's very, it's, 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 a, it's a classic French tip, piping tip. So I made a meringue, sugar, and, and, and whites. Uh, no, 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 <laughs> sorry. Um, so I've piped this and then dehydrated it in the dehydrator. So it's nice and crispy. You can hear it. So it's nice and crispy inside. So it's, it's, it's kind of just another use, as well as it adds a lot of sweetness. So for this, I like to pipe in a little bit more of the yema. Yes, oh, they grab it later. So we'll put a few more herbs on there. Just because I like the herbs too as well. So in the, so in the meringue, I'll pipe a little bit more yema, and that's, that is the dessert. There we are. So that is a centric dessert of duck eggs and basically using all egg things into it. So the duck white also is kind of like a little take on pavlova. So I wanted to add that also. A lot of ducks or a lot of egg centric dishes because of the meringue and the egg white is pavlova as well as uh, patachou items. So 
eggy dish, but comforting. Very smooth finish with the duck, and also very, very good flavor, which flavor first is always, for me, number one. Um, the next dish, actually, talking about eggs, is going into uni. And uni is, well, a seafood, yes? Um, it's a sea urchin. I like to eat it in sushi. Um, but one thing I do also like is to make savory items uh, with, with um, desserts. So similar to adding the garam masala into sweet stuff, so I chose to use uni into the dessert as well. So what I've done is I've also made an ice cream incorporating uni. And we have the ice cream mixture. Um, it has no egg. So essentially, we're using the uni as an egg filler in here. And egg in ice cream is used really for texture. It's for texture, slightly for flavor, more so for texture. So we've actually made an ice cream base, and then we've chilled it, and then we've added and hand blended in fresh local uni, actually, which we've been fortunate to get. So it's uni from the Philippines, which is very sweet, actually. And I was, I was really happy that we got local uni. Um, so I've made this into the Paco Jet can, um, canister. So if, if, if you guys don't know, this is, base, this is a Paco Jet. And all this is is really, it is a machine with a drill mechanism inside. And I, I believe this did come from Spain. So Paco Jet is actually an airline company. And they figured out how to make something like this and make small, for chefs able to make small increments of an ice cream. So we're fortunate, a lot of times we have batch freezers, that's what we call it, and we have to make big batches of ice cream. So, and it won't turn nice unless you have at least like uh, 3K of ice cream mixture. So here we only have like 350 grams of ice cream mixture in here. So what this actually does is it's a drill mechanism that there's a blade here and it's kind of like making ice cream backwards. You make your mixture, you put it in here, you stick it in the freezer. And then you, have, you put this blade on here and there's a magnet that helps it to stick. Oh, we need the beaker, the, the, the yes, yes. So this will actually fit in here and then the drill mechanism just goes down at 1,000 RPMs, more than 1,000 RPMs, and then spin, 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 spin. So it's spinning the ice cream actually frozen. So it's cutting all the ice crystals. You get a really, really smooth ice cream mixture, and it's a la minute. It, it's, it's at the moment, it's very fresh. It's fresh spun ice cream. It's an amazing product. It's very, it's, this is a very, very helpful tool for people who have small restaurants, and, and you know, you're not able to either have a large machine fit or, or monetary-wise. So this makes it very affordable as well as space-saving. Um, and we're going to spin that in just a bit. So I'll leave it out. Yeah, I'll leave it out for now. They're getting it? They're getting it? OK. Um, while we are waiting for our little beaker so that we can spin the ice cream, I'm going to let's do the long gum. So we'll, we'll put together. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. We'll, we'll, we'll sorry. <laughs> we'll do this one first, yes. So we'll build our little uni. So what I have done is I've made a little petit gâteau, so a little small cake, which I've glazed with a caramel glaze. So inside there is a, let me cut it actually. I will cut one for you. Inside is a caramel chocolate mousse, a cabana cream, which is calamansi, banana, and mango all together, made like a curd, fresh manila mango, and a banana cremo. On the bottom is a cashew moelleux, is what we call it, but it's basically um, an egg white mixture base. So it's almost like a it's egg whites with sugar, and then you fold in toasted meringue. So it's very, very similar to um, like Sanserval, or the Sanserval, the, the, um, the cake there, but not as crispy. So it's more cake. There is a little bit of cake flour in that. Um, no, that is trash. Yes, sorry. Um, so I've just built this as like a little gateau. And then to go with the uni look of things, I made some items that will help to make it look like uni. So, I have this twill that's a chocolate twill. 
Okay. Move. This is a very big rock. I brought it all the way from Los Angeles. It was heavy in the suitcase. No, this is, this is from here. <laughs> yeah. So I just like to stick these on to make it look like all the uni spikes. And I'll just keep going. And this is for texture. So we have crunch in here. And the chocolate that I've used in this dish, um, it's Egotard chocolate. It's local to me, so it's, it's sustainable. It's three generations of, of chocolate makers. They're based in Burlingame. Um, and it's fair trade. It's all fair trade. Um, the owners, the Guitards, their last name is Guitard. Um, Gary Guitard is the CEO, and um, he's the second generation. And uh, he has a relationship with all his cacao growers. So um, this is the chocolate, actually, right here. So I've used, I've used a 70% a Epique. That's what they have the names for their chocolate. And I've also used their milk chocolate. And then also um, a Ecuador chocolate. So the beans are from Ecuador and it's a 65%. And that's actually what I use to temper chocolate here. So I have these tempered needles as well that I'm using for the uni. And we'll just place them as so. And it adds very, a very rich, it's very rich. So, you know, however you use chocolates or choose your chocolates, it's really just what flavor you think will go well. As long as you maintain the integrity of the chocolate and, you know, pair things with it that taste great, it should hopefully, end product will taste great. So I'm just going to keep pressing these on. And as far as looking for things that are sustainable or using sustainable product, it's really about knowing where your food comes from and making those decisions for yourself. So these, these products and going into actually uh, sea urchin, do you want to put these on? Yes. Oh, Paco Jet is here, yes. Can I have you to keep going? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, just this empty, just all the way around. Very good, very good. So. I'm going to go back here to the Paco Jet, actually. And I'm going to spin my ice cream. I'm just going to make sure everything is in there. So we have a blade, and then we have a top, and then we have this little beaker. So we press a button, and it spins. It's going to be a little noisy, so. Oh, it's not as noisy. So that's a drill mechanism just going down. And you can actually see it on the face here, too. This version is actually quite quiet. This is the Pakajit 2, so it's the, it's the newer version. So we're very fortunate to have that. Um, while that is spinning, I'll just keep going here. Yeah, it is quiet. It's nice. It's almost soothing, like a massage. Thank you. So I'll keep placing these on. Once this is fully covered, the idea was that it resembles an uni. So this is to go with actually a shot that I've also prepared, which will go in this glass container. And that is where the uni ice cream will go. I'm going to keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Mm -hmm. So in this dessert as well, I've also made everything with duck eggs also. So Everything in both of these desserts are with duck eggs. So, and I was talking about the nutritional value of ducks, or, or at least being more nutritious than, than the latter, which is the egg, um, or I'm sorry, which is the chicken egg. Ducks are also alkaline. Duck eggs are alkaline, and chicken eggs are acidic. So when you're making stuff, sometimes people think that adding acid uh, will help to, to um, acid like lemon juice will help to to froth up your meringue, which it can, but I haven't had the, the need to do that, so it's not as necessary, but it's actually, 
um, something that people do do as well. So here I have my ice cream mixture, and it's nice and fluffy, if you can see that. It's nice and fluffy, it's fun, it's fresh, and it's also soft, yes. Uni, the uni ice cream. There is uni inside here. So, yes, local Philippine uni. Do we know where we got it from in the Philippines? I can't remember. Someone might have told us, but it slipped. Um, what I have prepared also is some fresh longan. In the States, I like to use lychee because we can get it there, but I was so fortunate that we can actually get longan, so I chose to use longan here. And the fruitiness of it goes really, really well with uni. And the other thing that goes well with uni is sake. So the sake is a little shooter that's in the bottom, and this is an unfiltered sake. Um, it's a little dry, so that goes well with the uni ice cream and the longan, so it's something that's not too sweet. So the idea in this dessert that I did um, is to, this is a little bit of almost like a pre-dessert. So you would have this with the egg notes and, or with the uni notes as well as, yes, as well as the uni and the longan and sake all together. So it should be very refreshing after a nice meal. And then here we have the uni. And just a little scoop inside the little shooter. And then, yes. And then we'll, we'll add some of our fresh uni. Nice and bright and orange, if you can see that. It's beautiful. Very lucky to have this. I'll place that in the front here. See if they can see that. And then, yes. We'll add a little bit of flour. So we like flour because we're pastry and we like things that are pretty. I like pink. So I'm gonna add a little bit of pink flour. And then I have a lychee calamansi twill that I'm also gonna add. So that's for a little bit of crunch. So we'll just put, place that inside. And then the other thing I actually did was a, kind of like a little fresh bonbon. So this is also the 70% chocolate from Ecuador. And then I filled it with some fresh mango puree inside also. So I put a little bit of color dust that's uh, very shiny. And then it's an uni um, silicone mold. And then so I place it here. And then the whole thing represents pretty much, well, uni. So this is my uni-centric dessert going into eggs. Using duck eggs with cooking. I hope you try it. It's amazing. Um, very good flavor, good vitamins, a little bit more cholesterol, but it's the good cholesterol. So I hope you do try to cook with it. Or t um, I know, I'm sure we have some balut lovers as well. So if you like balut, you will definitely love cooking with duck eggs. Um, and if you haven't tried the local Philippine uni, you really should. It is a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, everyone. Thank you so much, Sally. Once again, Sally Camacho. Please join us over here, Sally, for a few questions about your presentation and, of course, about your take on sustainable gastronomy. Congratulations. Oh, thank Another you. fantastic thank presentation you, for the you, afternoon. Thank you, thank you, All right, once again, we have a few minutes for your questions, so if anyone uh, would like to ask a question, just raise your hand and we'll uh, send a microphone over to you. You notice how everyone was so focused on your presentation. If there's one way to capture a Filipino crowd, it's with something sweet. Now, the downside is um, the sweet tooth of the Filipino has sometimes gone overboard, and it's been criticized uh, for, 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 for desserts that are, come across as too sweet sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, you've heard about that, haven't you? Yes, yes. And you have this thing about sweetness and balance. Tell us yes. about that. Well, I, for me, I love, I love eating savory food, you know, and I know I, I'm a pastry chef, of course, and I happen to be just very good at it, so um, that's what my career ended up being. So I wanted to make desserts that people will actually finish. A lot of times when you get something too sweet, you just eat a couple bites and then you're done because you say, oh, it's too sweet, I can't, I can't, I can't. But if you've got really great ingredients and if you have premier ingredients and you know how to keep the integrity of it, 
people will come back and have another bite, another bite, and then that's, that's what creates the memory. So I like using less sugar in my desserts, not too much just to use less sugar, but it doesn't need that extra sweetness. So if I'm using something that tends to be sweet, like honey, maple syrup, I'll use that as the sweetener and make sure that I use enough so that you get the flavor. So you, because there's, no, there's not a flavor in sugar. There's flavor in other things. There's flavor in fresh fruit. There's flavor in the amazing fruit that we've had here. Oh my goodness, I'm, it's just... It's, so it's, it's lazy to rely on sugar for yeah. sweet things, basically, yeah, yeah. right? Or also cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's also well, a cheap actually, way of no, sweetening. No, no, I don't think, I don't know if it's too cheap. I'm not sure of the sugar prices here, but sugar in, in the States is not very, it's not very cheap. I mean, it's just like any ingredient, it, everything goes up and up. But, you know, if you have the opportunity to use fresh, local, in-season fruits or vegetables, they all have that natural sweetness that you shouldn't overpower with more sugar. Of course, younger generations, not just in the Philippines, but all over the world, are, are, are of course, um, uh, in transition, away mm -hmm. from that sweetness of the past mm -hmm. and looking for something, well, basically less sweet. Yeah. Um, for chefs who are here, what are some of the alternatives they can rely on for sweetening their, their desserts without relying on brown or white sugar and, oh, and all that? Definitely for sweetening their desserts, um, beets are actually really very, very good to either cook with or add to desserts. So I actually even like, you know, candy or dry beets to go into something. And of course, if you're using something that's in the season, in the now, that's seasonal, it's gonna have its, it's, gonna have its maximum sugar content that's natural. So you'll get that flavor and that you can't even replace with sugar. And it's, it's, that's, that's really what it's about. It's about eating stuff that's seasonal and local as well. And because, natural. And natural, absolutely natural. I mean, things that are unnatural and all these unnatural sugars, you don't really need it. It's not really, I don't really promote that as being something that you should have ingested in you, so. Right. Thanks so much, Sally. Yeah, someone was raising their hand somewhere. Mm -hmm. I was uh, being flat. All right, that person uh, put back. Okay, over there. Sorry. Wow. Yes, go ahead. Hello. Oh, hi. Hi, Chef Sally. I've been um, following you since Top Chef Just Desserts over here. Okay. okay. Hi. All the way in the back. Hello. Over yeah. There. Okay. Yeah. I've been following you since Top Chef Just Desserts. I honestly think you should have won. You're such a badass in the kitchen. Um, I actually wanted to ask you, knowing the stuff that you've made, you have a penchant for using um, savory, classically savory ingredients in your pastry. So you've used um, forbidden black rice, but forbidden black rice. Uh, you may, you, class, you use, you, as you mentioned, turmeric and mango in your desserts. I remember the one you made for Jordan Khan on the show. And things like uni. Would you happen to have advice for trying to balance savory, um, savory notes in classic pastry without necessarily going overboard? Absolutely. Taste your food. That's really it. Taste your food. If you're making something as, an, as a professional chef and you're trying to do something that's a little overboard or maybe, you know, against the grain or something, you know, not as straight and segueing into unique and, and different products going with dessert that people might not be used to, taste it first. That's really it. Don't let your customers be your, your, taste, your tasting guinea pigs. You need to do that as a professional. If you don't taste your food and you're putting it out there, that's not something that I would advise. That, that's kind of a, a, really, a really amateur move. So definitely do that for yourself. It also makes yourself better. So you can back your, your plates, you can back your flavors, you can back your desserts. I hope that answers your question. Okay, Sally, you said flavor comes mm. first. You, yes. You're very adamant about that. Um, what about the, the visuals of, of the desserts, uh, which is um, increasingly mm. important in our age of Instagram, Pinterest? Sure. Um, what kind of importance do you give uh, the three dimensions of the dessert, the architecture of the dessert, and, um, well, basically, what's your approach to it? Um, I feel that the approach for a visual for desserts is definitely where we come from. So being in pastry and making sweet items, people want to eat with their eyes first. It's kind of just a known. So we do focus that on pastry. Um, my advice, again, is to also eat your dessert. <laughs> Try your food. You know, if you think that something is going to look nice, um, put it on and eat it together. If it either brings something to a plate, great. If it doesn't, uh, then maybe, you know, maybe sometimes it's not as important. Um, I just think that, yeah, definitely flavor first. And, and I know Instagram is very big. It, it, it's great for our actual, our industry. It, it's, re it's been a really, really great positive tool. Um, I think the sharing of Instagram is also very, very um, positive moving forward in how people are actually even cooking and making pastry because they see something cool and then they want to try it which is really great, and that's, that's how we grow as an industry. 
but definitely my Flavor advice is to first. flavor comes first. Eat it. If you see a garnish and it's not edible, don't put it on the plate. Eat it first. So that's that's really it. All right. All right. Any more questions? Let's talk about sustainability. Um, you, you mentioned earlier something about um, knowing, you should know where your food comes from, and from that point on, make a decision whether mm -hmm. you want to use it in your cooking or not. Um, where do you draw the line? Um, when it comes to fair trade, when it comes to um, ethically sourced uh, ingredients, uh, carbon footprint, so on and so forth. I think, I don't know if there's, there's, there's somewhere where you can draw, well, yeah, if you can draw the line. I mean, if you know where your food comes from and it's, it's not hurting the environment or, or having a negative impact on humanity as well as, and especially your environment, um, I would say, yeah, you know, that, that's where you choose to make the right decision or, or your decision to whether eat but something But personally, or for you, something. are oh, you very me? strict about your, oh, your standards? Oh, I'm very strict. Yeah, for me, I'm very strict. I, we, we only... We do our best, as far as I know, to eat organic wherever we are, locally sourced. Um, I go to the farmer's market on Wednesdays, um, Sundays also, so, and I do my best to eat or, or shop at farmer's market and at least knowing where the farms are, where we get our food. And for um, your pastries, I mean. Oh, for pastry? Oh, I mean, I will do my best to get the best product because that's what I want to feed my people. That, that's what I want to feed people that I'm, I'm making food for. I want to feed them the best or else why am I in this industry? Last I heard, you had a rooftop garden. Uh, well, you, you, is that correct? Oh, in when I was at Jonathan Club. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Rooftop yes, garden. Yes, yes. And um, is that something you want to continue? Absolutely. Uh, is it important for a pastry chef? We know how important it is for, for, for chefs. Uh, yes. But for pastry chefs, uh, is it critical to have your own garden or farm? I, I would like to say it's critical, yes. I would like to say that, you know, what pastry does as far as using, using the same items or the same kind of... Um, you know, kitchen equipment and tools is just as important for savory. So the attention should be should be made or put to pastry chefs to have things like that. So it, I think it's an I, I think it's an amazing thing. I, I mean, I myself I also cook savory, so I like to talk about if we do have a garden, you know, get the things on the menu for that too as well before they have dessert also. So okay, another question here. We'll get here, but first, someone in the center. Who is that? Hi. Oh, there, the back. Go ahead. Hi, yes. <laughs> so I, just a question as a fan. I know that you use a lot of Asian influences in your desserts. What's your favorite Filipino dessert? Hmm. My favorite Filipino dessert. My mom's pork barbecue. Dessert. Dessert. I know. <laughs> I know. She, remember she said she loves savory I know. stuff, right? I love right? savory. <laughs> I love savory. Um, no, she eats it at the end of her meal. <laughs> I do, I do. Filipino I barbecue. I think my favorite Filipino dessert is probably um, almost anything with ube. I love ube. I really, really love ube. I grew up eating ube, having ube cake, you know, from, from, from Filipino bakeries in Los Angeles. Um, and we just always grew up with that. And, and just the, um, even having the jam or the fresh ube, as well as in halo halo. Is that something you include in your, in your Absolutely, desserts? Absolutely, yes. I love including ube in my desserts. It's hard to get, though, in the States. So, you know, we get it in dry form or sometimes in a mix. Um, and then I don't know where it's coming from. So I sometimes try not to use it. Um, there is another, there's another product that we get in the States. It's called Okinawan Purple Potato. And it looks very much like ube. It's just a little bit smaller, I think. So I, I feel that that is ube. So when I use that, and it's Okinawan purple potato, but I, I put it as ube on my menu. Yeah. So anything with ube is the answer to? Ube and my mom's pork barbecue. Barbecue. <laughs> pork barbecue. Over here, yeah. Hi. Um, are you planning to stay in the Philippines long enough to do a little exploring? And if so, um, have you had the chance to see if there are any new ingredients that you might want to use in some of your desserts? Um, new ingredients or new flavors? Absolutely. Um, we are, I'm sorry, the, qu the first part was... Um, are you planning to stay longer to explore the Philippines? Oh, yes. And look, look for ingredients? Look for and ingredients? how often do you really come back anyway? Oh, my goodness. Okay, so uh, just to the... For the okay, in other words, um, what do you think would be next after Ube? Because... You know, ube's been after ube. I mean, something right that you can't get in the states is is the mangoes here, and I know that's you know such an everyday item here. But man, in the states, they're completely different. I mean, the ones here surpass them by eons. So it's there's there's no fiber in them, um, and they're much sweeter. 
and you get them year round. The ones that we get in the States, they're prob I think they're cultivated in Mexico most, mostly, um, but they are very tart. They're very different for me. So being here, I, I definitely love to, love to incorporate anything or consume anything Manila mango. <laughs> um, as far as staying longer in the Philippines, we are going to go to um, a couple other uh, regions. Um, after this, though, I'll be going to Palawan and Bicol. Um, and definitely looking for new items as, as, as to work with um, more pastry stuff. And I heard earlier, a couple of days ago, in the beginning here about some mango flour. So I actually wanted to see that with in the, in, the, uh, in the event here. So I'm excited to actually see that. I've been cooking a lot, so I can't wait to see what, what, what's outside here. Um, so I am definitely looking forward to looking for some more ingredients that I can actually bring back home and cook with. What about Philippine chocolate? I mean, that's one thing oh. that we've been really promoting hard in the past years. Very that's good. something that excites you because you're using Ecuadorian chocolate, Absolutely. not Philippine chocolate. Yes, I would love, love, love to use Philippine chocolate. I actually did use it when we did a pop-up to, to kind of kick off um, the Manila Madrid fusion. So on August 4th, I did a, a, a pop-up dessert degustation with uh, three other pastry chefs, uh, Nico Aspiris, uh, Sunshine, and uh, Christine, uh, and over at Le Petit Souffle. Um, in Fashion Hall, and we were able to use uh, Aura chocolate. Aura is a local chocolate also, and it was just amazing, amazing. I was so excited to use it. I hope to take some that I can also use it back in Los Angeles. Um, I'm, I'm just so excited for all the ingredients that I have seen. We were also very fortunate to go to the farmer's market, um, if anybody saw that. Um, I think it was on the news too. And just the ingredients, I mean, I was just mind blown. These are things that I've never seen. I mean, the mantis shrimp, the little green mangoes, the little baby, baby mangoes. Um, gosh, some of them, I can't even remember their names, but I was just trying to try everything that I could see. It was, it was amazing. I, I need to go back because it was just sensory overload. And I, you, I, I, You'll I, always be welcome back in the oh Philippines. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, uh, Sally Camacho, Mueller. Thank you. Here Thank in you. Manila right now from Madrid for Sean Manila. Thank you. Thank you so much Thank and good you. luck. Thank we you. We look forward to your new project. Thank you. Let us know when it opens, okay? Absolutely, yes. It's going to be in September. Yes, All right, September. I will let you know. yes. The Philippine <laughs> Press. We yes. would love to know more about yes. that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.